I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's May 14th, and we have a lot to talk about. And I want to take just a moment out of today's episode to acknowledge that this is the 350th episode of this podcast. If you want to add in the bonus episodes that appear throughout the year, then we're looking at just about 400 episodes. And for that, I want to thank each of you. Most of you show up every single week. And a lot of you take time from your own busy day to shoot me an email or DM with your feedback and suggestions. So I look at these 350 episodes as our accomplishment together. And as always, I'm excited to continue this conversation for as long as you're here for it. There are more than 20 disease-modifying therapies available today. Some are considered high efficacy, some are considered moderately effective, and each has its own potential risks and side effects to consider. So, how do you choose? How much homework should someone living with MS do? Where should you look for reliable information? And what if you and your neurologist don't necessarily agree? Well, joining me to talk about your role and responsibility when it comes to shared decision-making with your neurologist or other members of your MS care team is Dr. Barbara Geiser, Dr. Geyser is a neurologist at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. She's an internationally recognized clinician and award-winning educator who's specialized in the care of people with multiple sclerosis since 1982, a full decade before there was even a single disease-modifying therapy available to treat MS. I should also mention that Dr. Geyser is the editor of the Primer on Multiple Sclerosis, That's the reference book that thousands of healthcare professionals rely on every day to better understand how to best treat MS. But before we get to my conversation with Dr. Barbara Geyser, there are a few other things that you should know about. I always enjoy introducing you to people whom I consider to be difference makers, and there are all kinds of difference makers in the MS community. They might be scientists or clinicians or rehab specialists. They might be care partners who are killing it when it comes to caring for a loved one with MS. Or they might be someone living with MS who's found their own unique way of changing the world. They could even be someone who's found a unique way of raising money for MS research. Blake Arnett is one of those people. Blake has taken his passion and experience playing basketball and turned it into an event called Dunk MS, a novel and entertaining way to raise funds for MS research. Blake's been a guest on this podcast before, and with Dunk MS set to take place in just a few days, we recently reconnected to talk about the 2024 edition of Dunk MS. Blake Arnett played his college basketball at UCLA, and on May 18th, Blake will be back at UCLA at Iconic Poly Pavilion, raising funds for MS research through Dunk MS. Welcome back to the podcast, Blake. Hey, John. Great to be here. Before we get into this, what I'll have to call an amazing event, let's lay some groundwork. Your family was affected by MS. Can you tell me about that? That's correct. Yes. So my mom was diagnosed with MS back in 2007 when I was a junior in high school. Um, and we, we saw her, the progression pretty quickly, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, she went from, you know, fully mobile uh, down within two years to, you know, multiple hospital visits and down to a walker. Um, unfortunately, she, she, she suddenly passed away two years later in 2009, the summer before my sophomore year at UCLA. Um, and, you know, obviously it was a shock to the family, um, but, you know, through through family, through friends, through our through our faith, we uh, we persevered as she would want us to. Um, and we'll be doing walk MS and bike MS as a family. And then, you know, the idea for Dunk MS came later on and I can talk about that later. But, yeah, that's the kind of the origin story. So, yeah, let's talk about Dunk MS. First, what's it all about? 
Yeah. So it's a, a pretty unique event. Um, it is the world's first charity dunk show. And so on a high level, the event is a kid's basketball clinic for an hour and a half. But during that time, we have a whole basketball court dedicated to sponsor tables, to a wellness center. Uh, we have raffle prizes. Uh, we have vir- a virtual sign auction, a kid zone, uh, DJ playing upbeat music. Our funds go to MS Research at UCLA Health, uh, led by world-renowned MS researcher Dr. Voskel, who I know is a has been on this this pod before, and you know obviously a big name in the MS space. And so uh, the funds go to Dr. Voskel uh, for many years, for most of the time we've been doing Dunk MS. But something new this year that I want to call out is we're adding in an MS community zone. And so I've gotten feedback. It's kind of been like a networking event for the MS community. And so I I added this idea, this initiative this year. And so what that's going to be is a private and relaxed space for the MS community to come together, connect, talk to each other, um, and learn from each other as well. So that'll be a private space at Dunk MS um, underneath. It's like it's a big media room underneath the bleachers at Ply Pavilion. It's a nice room. And so I'm that's sponsored by Heart of Hope, my other initiative, as well as the MS Society. And so I want to make sure I call that out because that's going to be a special uh, part of the event. And then it, the event ends with a pro dunk show at uh, towards the end. So I get the world's top pro dunkers to do an amazing dunk show. Um, and so, yeah, that's that really the event in a nutshell. Uh, it's about a three-hour event, pretty quick, free food, free snacks, uh, free sponsor gifts. And we had 500 people show up last year. My goal is to have 750 show up this year, and hopefully we can raise over 100 grand. So those are some of my goals. Hope we can get there. And I just had so much support uh, to make this happen. Well, before we get into some of these other details, since you mentioned uh, Dr. Rhonda Vaskul, who heads up uh, the MS program at UCLA, I want to remind my listeners that just a few weeks ago, we featured her on the podcast, talked all about the fact that she was just named this year's recipient of the John Distel Prize in MS Research. So uh, she's certainly, uh, her, her name is uh, at the top of everybody's mind. And I know that uh, these funds are going to go to all the right places. So I, I uh, much appreciate your efforts. You know, a, a little bit ago, you mentioned Walk MS and Bike MS, and, and clearly a lot of people do their fundraising by participating in events like that. But you came up with this idea to showcase dunks from some of the world's top basketball dunkers. Where did that all come from? How did, how did you get your start in Dunk MS? Good, good question. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've been doing walk MS and bike MS as a family ever since, you know, our mom passed, you know, raising a decent amount of money. Um, But I thought to myself with my background in sports coaching, basketball, you know, at UCLA and entrepreneurship, why don't I create my own event you know, something that's that's new, that's never been seen before. And so I actually thought of the idea back in 2017. So it took me about a year. I, I, want, to get, I want to give myself time, uh, a year to network with the MS community, with UCLA Health, MS Society on a deeper level, and then how to actually create an event, right? I took time to like, what are all the components to make this successful? And so it did, definitely did not happen overnight. Uh, maybe the idea did, but the actual execution and thought <laughs> took about a year, just so for the listeners to understand. Um, but again, a lot of help as well from family, from friends. Um, yeah, I thought with my unique background, I can make something special happen. Uh, in our first year, we had 200 people show up and he raised 45 grand. So I knew I had something, something there and all this, I do this all on the side, you know, outside of my, my, uh, you know, career. Over time, since you started about how much has Dunk MS raised for research? Yeah, we've raised over 200 and. I want to say 250,000 from 2018 till today. We, we, I want to grow every year. Last year was 75 grand. And so I'm trying to grow that every, every year more and more. So, Well, in an effort to uh, help those numbers grow a little bit, I know uh, Dunk MS gets underway Saturday, May 18th at 11 a.m. at UCLA's Poly Pavilion. And if you're listening and you're in the Southern California area and you have not been to Poly Pavilion yet, if you want to visit an iconic basketball palace, do yourself a favor and be there for Dunk MS. And to that point, how can people find tickets? 
Yes, yes. Everything will be at dunkms.com. So yes, the event is this Saturday. Yeah, so please come out. You do not have to be a basketball fan. So just so everyone knows, um, I get that question a lot. And so I made this event specifically, not just for basketball fans or parents or kids, but people without kids, people in the MS community, obviously. So um, I urge you to please come out. We have a special promo code for the MS community, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, share that here. Uh, simply go to our website, go to our ticketing site, and the promo code is simply MS. And they are $5 GA tickets. Usually they're $20. I'm bringing it down to $5. So please come out. Let's pack Polly. And I think you'll find this event very fun and very valuable. Well, Blake Arnett, thanks for looking at your world and the things you were passionate about and finding a very creative way to use those things to raise money for furthering MS research. And thanks so much for talking with me today. Of course. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. At the top of this episode, you might remember me referring to the role and responsibilities that someone living with MS has when it comes to developing their treatment plan. Evidence shows that shared decision-making between a doctor and patient leads to better adherence to that treatment plan. But making an informed decision requires that someone has an adequate knowledge about their condition and any potential risks that might be associated with different medications. Now, that may sound like common sense, but two researchers in the UK wanted to see if that was actually the case in the real world. So they did a systematic review of other already completed peer review studies to determine what patients really understood about MS and the risks associated with deciding which disease-modifying therapy might be best. They found 18 studies that provided enough data for their purposes. Combined, these studies gave them information on 4,420 people living with MS, including almost 3,000 people with relapsing remitting MS, 407 people with secondary progressive MS, and 279 people with primary progressive MS. Additionally, there were 178 people diagnosed with clinically isolated syndrome, and then a group of people with what the researchers categorized as an unclear diagnosis. 65% of the people in the study were female, and the median age among the study subjects was just over 40 and a half years old. Among the 18 studies included in this review, about 46% of the study subjects were from Germany, 23% were from Italy, 17% were from the United States, almost 5% were from Saudi Arabia, 3.5% were from Australia, a little over 2% were from Brazil, and the balance were from Canada, Spain, Turkey, the Netherlands, and Serbia. In analyzing this population, the researchers relied on scores from what were considered to be validated measures of MS knowledge. For example, a large number of the people in this study had completed a tool used to measure MS knowledge called, appropriately enough, the MS Knowledge Questionnaire. And the mean score, the average score on that measurement tool, turned out to be 13.6 out of a possible 23. When it came to analyzing how risks and benefits of a disease-modifying therapy were weighed, the study participants completed a decision-making task designed to assess their willingness to take a hypothetical DMT as its efficacy and the probability of side effects varied. The mean score here was 17.4 out of a possible 23. The participants registered a mean score of 17.5 when it came to making other treatment decisions. Drilling down into the details, the researchers found that these less-than-stellar scores were not dependent on age or gender, but they were, to a significant extent, dependent upon an individual's education level, showing that people with a higher level of education were more likely to possess a higher level of knowledge about MS and were more able to make a reasoned, informed decision about their treatment options. Now, the result of this study isn't particularly great news, but I take it as a sort of challenge. I believe that listening to this podcast can make someone a better, more engaged patient. 
I know that listening to this podcast can increase someone's knowledge and understanding of multiple sclerosis. And I'm thinking, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know someone else who's also living with MS. Perhaps you can do them a favor and shoot them an email or text with a link to Real Talk MS. With a back catalog of 350 episodes, it's very likely they're going to find an episode that might help them get a handle on a specific treatment option or just provide some general information that they're going to find useful the next time they see their neurologist. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. It's not uncommon that, over time, an individual living with MS experiences their symptoms getting worse, but finds that there's no change on their MRI. So, it seems like something is going on in their brain or spinal cord, And that something has been described by what I consider to be an unfortunate choice of words. It's being described as smoldering inflammation. I think it's more accurately and appropriately described as persistent hidden inflammation. In other words, there's inflammation taking place somewhere in the central nervous system, but it isn't being seen by that MRI. Now, the results of a small study conducted at Harvard's Brigham and Women's Hospital show that positron emission tomography, better known as PET scans, may be capable of detecting that persistent hidden inflammation. In this study, investigators used PET scans to detect and map abnormal microglial activation. Now, don't let that phrase worry you. Microglia are specialized immune cells in the central nervous system, primarily in the brain, and they patrol the central nervous system looking for and getting rid of damaged cells. If you wanted to think of microglia as sort of trash collectors, you wouldn't be wrong. And it's been theorized that among people with MS, these microglia misbehave, and rather than carrying out their mission, they cause damage and inflammation. So in this study, the research team wanted to determine the efficacy of disease-modifying therapies in reducing this abnormal microglia activity. The researchers recruited 22 people with MS and 8 healthy people to serve as a control group. They performed 30 PET scans and compared the microglia activity among the people with MS and the healthy control group. And among the 22 people with MS, they looked at differences between those who were on a high-efficacy DMT and those who were on no treatment or were being treated with lower-efficacy disease-modifying therapies. Analyzing the PET scans, the research team determined there was higher microglia activation in both white and gray matter in the brain among the 22 study participants with MS. They also determined that the microglia activity among those participants who were on a high-efficacy DMT was significantly lower than among those study participants who were on a lower-efficacy DMT. But compared to the healthy control group, the level of microglia activity was still abnormally high in both the high-efficacy and lower-efficacy groups. The research team also reported that the PET scans showed the damage to an individual's brain that was correlated with disability and fatigue. The results of this small study demonstrate that using sophisticated PET scans, doctors can uncover the hidden inflammation that's part of the disease process in multiple sclerosis. And having a better understanding of this inflammatory activity opens the door to developing therapies designed to stop it. While larger studies are needed to further validate these results, this study is a step forward in shining a bright light on one of the dark mysteries of multiple sclerosis. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. The number of disease-modifying therapies approved for MS continues to grow. So, with more than 20 choices of high-efficacy and more moderately effective DMTs available, How do you and your neurologist identify the best treatment for you? In a moment, we'll meet my guest, Dr. Barbara Geiser, 
who weighs in with thoughts about how shared decision-making, when done right, can lead to the right disease-modifying therapy for you. Dr. Barbara Geyser is a neurologist at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. She's an internationally recognized clinician and award-winning educator specializing in the care of people with multiple sclerosis since 1982. Dr. Geyser has received a dozen awards for excellence in education at the local, regional, and national levels, and is the author of over 100 publications, including peer-reviewed research articles, reviews, textbooks, chapters, and abstracts. In fact, she served as the editor of the Primer on Multiple Sclerosis. That's the reference book that thousands of healthcare professionals rely on to better understand how to best treat MS. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Geyser. Good morning, John. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. I will say parenthetically, I don't know about the reference, but I appreciate the shout out. So we're talking about disease-modifying therapies, and with more than 20 DMTs approved to treat MS, how do you choose one? It's it's a great question, and uh, again, I'm so happy that you brought this up as a topic for conversation. Uh, as you noted, I've been doing this a very long time, and when I started in the MS field, we did not have any disease-modifying therapies. We had steroids, um, and that was about it. So when the very first disease-modifying therapy, beta interferon, was approved in 1993, it was really a sea change. And for the first time in the, you know, long recorded history of MS, we were able to tell people with MS, we have something that can control this process. We can't cure it. We can't shut it down completely. But, you know, the disease is no longer going to want to do what it, what it wants. And in some respects, in the early days of disease modifying therapy, it was a little easier. We only had a couple to choose from and they were all fairly equivalent in safety and efficacy. And I don't know that it made a big difference. So now what I sometimes tell people is the good news is we have about two dozen of these therapies to choose from. The bad news is we have about two dozen of these therapies to choose from. And there isn't a one best one. There isn't a one right one. This is a very individualized approach that should be done um, uh, as part of uh, a shared decision making process between the person with MS and the healthcare care provider. Um, and it's it's very nuanced. What what we have learned over the past 30-odd years, um, we used to take an escalation approach. So as we began to acquire more agents and some seemed to be more effective than others, uh, but the more effective ones generally had a little more of a side effect profile, we would say, well, let's start you on perhaps a, a less efficacious but safer agent, and many patients did well on that. And if they didn't, if they had either breakthrough clinical relapses or uh, activity on the MRI, we could say, okay, let's escalate. And uh, what we now think we know is that people who are started earlier on a more effective or a more aggressive therapy, if you will, tend to have better outcomes down the line. So this is one guideline, if you will, not an absolute, but one guideline, uh, especially when we are dealing with newly diagnosed or treatment-naive patients, we may uh, tend to want to put them on a more effective agent from the get-go. Um, other <clears throat> other considerations that, that would steer us toward um, putting somebody on a more aggressive agent would be if they've had a lot of relapses, if they have a lot of inflammatory activity, if they have spinal cord lesions. Those are things that that tend to suggest we really got to hit this thing hard. We often talk about the value of shared decision-making between a patient and their doctor on this podcast. So I'll pose that same question from the patient's perspective. With more than 20 disease-modifying therapies approved to treat MS, how does a patient educate themselves enough so that they're ready to make an informed decision about their DMT with their neurologist? That's that's a great question. And um, what I, I loved you said about being informed and being educated. Um, there used to be an ad for an old clothing store, and the, the ad for the clothing store was an informed uh, consumer is our best customer. And I think I think an informed patient is the patient that, that's best equipped to, to manage their MS. So I would think that 
the, the education certainly starts with the health care provider. Um, I, I think it is the responsibility of the health care provider to uh, provide the person with MS with uh, education in the office, education coming directly from the health care provider and other resources that the person with MS can go to. The National MS Society, for example, has all the disease modifying therapies listed on their website. Each of the different websites, each of the different uh, disease modifying therapies has a website. And uh, while you take into account that some of that, you know, may be marketing material, they, they do provide the facts. So I think the education process begins with the healthcare provider, and there may be some additional resources the patient can access as well. I think the other nice thing about starting the, the education process in the office is obviously the person with MS has the opportunity to ask questions, i.e., well, you said this drug can cause that side effect. Can you tell me a little more about it? You know, a very common patient complaint is, I don't feel any better. Why isn't my DMT working? So first, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you answer that question. And then I'd like to hear your thoughts about how we might be able to avoid that question altogether. And again, I, I have a little perspective having having done this for a while. And, and when the, the first DMD came out, they'd interfere on it, it was injectable. And we would say to patients, OK, you're going to have to give yourself a shot several times a week or every day, and you may have some side effects from it, and it's not going to make anything better. And, and they would look at us in horror. So I think you have to begin any conversation about disease-modifying therapy, which uh, to, to state clearly from the outset, these are uh, preventative agents. Right now, we don't quite have the capacity to reverse damage. We don't have the capacity for repair. That's going to be the next generation of treatments. But right now, we can stop or retard disease progression. And so I think if the, the person with MS starts out from that perspective, they're a little better prepared to know what to expect. Consider this hypothetical scenario. Uh, we're in a neurologist's office. Uh, the patient is there. They're having a conversation about disease-modifying therapies, and uh, maybe that neurologist has um, has not necessarily been keeping up with the current literature. They they have a busy schedule, and so they recommend Copaxone because it's something they've recommended for a very long time. Now that newly diagnosed patient has done a bit of research, or at the very least, they've caught the TV commercial, and they're interested in starting Ocrevus. What should the ensuing conversation between the patient and that neurologist be like? Uh, again, and, and I go back to the, the um, uh, statement that, that there isn't a one best drug. Um, of all the, what we have about two dozen disease modifying therapies, we don't have two dozen me different mechanism of actions because there are certain drugs in a the class. They're like two or three different brands of the same class. So if you go by mechanism of action, we have about 10 or 11 different mechanisms, different classes, different mechanisms of action. And of the disease modifying therapies, we, we kind of semi arbitrarily divide them into low efficacy, medium efficacy, and higher efficacy based on their uh, um, effects. You know, say, so what do you mean by high efficacy? Well, higher efficacy drugs are those that have a more pronounced effect on decreasing relapses and decreasing inflammation. Those are uh, two of the main outcome measures in most of the clinical trials. There are others, of course. Um, so Copaxone is, is in our low efficacy tier, and Ocrevus would be one of the drugs in the high efficacy tier. And I think the conversation should be the relative efficacies and side effect profiles of those drugs um, and also what the individual um, clinical situation of the patient is. Um, and as I say, uh, I think most um, MSologists, if you will, uh, based on studies, would be more inclined to start somebody on a high efficacy drug. Um, now, again, there are obviously individual considerations, and if you had a patient who, for whatever reason, 
you thought perhaps might not be able to tolerate the potential side effects of a higher efficacy drug, you might have to go to a safer or lower efficacy drug because of that. Uh, but as I say, it's it's nuanced. I heard you start to answer this question a moment ago, but it's uh, it's an important one. So I think it's it's worth uh, kind of focusing on for a moment. You mentioned that an informed patient is the best kind of patient. Today, people find a lot of information and go on to make important life decisions based upon what they read or see posted on social media sites. Is that a good place to look for information on disease-modifying therapies or or really any aspect of your treatment? Um, You know, and, and I, certainly, and, and this is a cliche, but the Internet is, of course, a double-edged sword. You can get all kinds of terrific information on it, and you can get a lot of really scary out-there information. Um, I I don't go on social media and and I'm not really familiar with a lot of what goes on out there. I think in terms of of using the the internet you want to go to a a vetted uh for want of a better word legitimate website again like the National MS Society. Um I, I my scientist friends tell me that the plural of anecdote is not data. So if somebody is posting anecdotal uh, information, I think you have to take that for, for what it is. I, I think people can certainly share experiences, and it may be helpful for somebody who has some trepidation about a disease-modifying agent to read somebody's post, oh, I started taking, you know, whatever disease-modifying therapy, and these are the side effects I had initially, but now I'm doing fine, or I'm taking X disease-modifying therapy, and these are some of the ways I deal with the side effects. But in terms of, of objective data, in terms of efficacy and, and safety and things like that, I don't know that, that anecdotes are the best source. If a patient feels like they're just not being heard by their treating neurologist, what can they say that might change things? You know, a healthcare provider is only, we're only as good as the information we get. So if a person with MS is having a side effect or doesn't understand something or has, we're not going to know unless they, they tell us. And um, I always feel badly when a patient thinks that they're not being heard. So, you know, sometimes you just have to be forthcoming and say, I don't understand why this is happening. Or can you explain to me why we are doing this? Or I read that this drug can cause this side effect. Neurologists, for the most part, we're reasonably smart, but we're not mind readers. And you have to tell us what's on your mind. Well, Dr. Barbara Geiser, I want to thank you for all you do to improve the lives of people living with MS. And thanks so much for talking with me today. And I'd like to thank you for all you do to improve the lives of people with MS by giving them information. And thank you very much for inviting me to be a guest on your podcast. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 350. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices. 